Hey everybody, this video is going to be on setting circles on a mount. In this case it's a German Equatorial mount. It's an Orion Atlas EQ. And you've got first bunch here is what's called right ascension. And that's just east and west. And then the other one is your declination which is north and south. And all the setting circles are is it tells you the position of an object. So whether you're looking at a star or a galaxy, planet, whatever, it doesn't matter. Its current location would have this information. So it would be, say, 12 hours, 43 minutes, 19.8 seconds, which would be in east and west in right ascension. So right ascension is based on time. It's based on a 24-hour clock. And that's because it takes 24 hours for the Earth to rotate. And then your north and south here goes from 0 to 90, and it's plus or minus, which plus is north and minus is south. 0 would be the equator. So if something's at plus 90, it would be straight overhead if you were standing on the North Pole. If it was 0, it would be straight overhead if you're standing on the equator. Now where I live here in Indiana, I'm about 39 degrees above the equator. So if something is 39 degrees above, when it's at its highest point, I should say, in the sky, it would be straight overhead. And since I've mentioned that, the things now, if you were standing on the North Pole, you would actually see the stars, like say the ones that were up at 90, they would stay overhead. Say if something was 85, it would be 85 degrees above the horizon, and it would just be constantly going around a circle, staying at that same height. And the things that were down by its horizon would be staying at the horizon. They'd just be going around a circle. So here is a closer up view of your RA circle, which if you remember I mentioned that this one is based on a 24 hour clock. So if you begin here at zero, which if you're not familiar with 24 hour time, zero is midnight. One would be 1 a.m. to 2 a.m all the way up. 12 would be high noon. 13 o'clock would be 1 p.m. 14 is 2 and so on all the way up to you get up to 23 hours would be 11 p.m. But in here we're just dealing with the position and if you notice I think you can see it here if it's focused good enough and everything. This bottom set of numbers here like see I've got the 20 and then above it is a 4. This lower set here is the northern hemisphere so that's what I deal with. If you lived in the southern hemisphere like in Australia or South America, you would use the top set of numbers, the 4 instead of 20 and 5 instead of 19 and so on. But I'll just be talking about the big ones, the northern hemisphere numbers since it makes sense to me and go from there. Now on here, if you can see it good enough, we've got the little gradations in between the hours. Like say you go from 0 hours up here to 1 hour. It's broken up into 10 minute increments. So you go from 0 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40, 50 minutes, up to the next hour. Now, that's not what you would call really accurate, right? Because when you look at a, the information on a star chart for a star, it's going to give you hours, minutes, seconds, but you can't get that close there. So you have to kind of do on here is go down to try to get it down into a few minutes if you can. It's like what I do. I've got another little piece of paper here I printed out and all I did was I used a typewriter and I tried to get it to where I could put the distance down so I've got basically a five minute set of lines is what it amounts to. These lines on here are five minutes apart. So what I'd do is if something was at, instead of at zero, say if it was five minutes after, I would just move the zero over one line and that would help me center up this five minutes in between the zero and the ten. And then if I'm looking really close, you know, I could put on a pair of reading glasses or even if you have a magnifying glass, which is a little hard to do at night, but the reading glasses work pretty good for me. I could try to just set it slightly off center. Which to be honest with you, I don't know how good it really would work to try to get one in two minutes. If you can go between get like five minutes, that's pretty reasonable. If you try to get seven minutes, you can kind of guess. But I'm not convinced that these ten minute marks are exactly the same distance from each other as you go all the way around the dial. And the reason is because I've laid metal rulers, say a 24 inch ruler, right next to each other at work before when I worked in the printing industry. And what we would do was see if, say, the one eighth inch was exactly an eighth of an inch 
minutes on all of them, a sixteenth and a thirty second, and found out that the rulers weren't all perfectly identical. They just couldn't. I mean, when they stamped these numbers in here where they'd actually stamp it into the metal, the metal might kind of expand or contract depending on the temperature, I guess. So one time what they did, the management of the company ordered like 50 or 60 rulers and they went through them all and they found maybe eight or ten of them or whatever that they felt like were exactly the same and they agreed with rulers that were mounted permanently on some of our equipment so that we were all measuring with the same standard. But you know these are reasonable so if you're guessing between you know a few minutes that's fine and in order for that to really work for you when you're trying to find something look at something with a wide field so you want to go with your lowest power eyepiece if you can or even in your finder scope and that really helps and then you can find it. I'll kind of explain that a little more too here as I go. So on the right ascension one there remember that the lines are 10 minutes apart and you can kind of estimate and then easily find the five minutes and you can kind of find seven minutes or two minutes something like that but you're not going to get it down to really tight. Okay. So now I've got a close-up here of the declination one. So you're north and south, and these are in degrees. And here, the increments are two degrees apart. So you have like 60, 62, 64, 66, 68, and 70. And it's a challenge to get these dead on. I get like a parallax error, I guess you'd call it. Because uh, when I do it, I like looking at it from up here on this side of the scope on the mount simply because there's less stuff in the way. Uh, I know you can't see it in this image but down on the bottom part there's actually a mark that the manufacturer put there but it's just hard for me to see that mark when the telescope's on here because I'll be hitting my head on it. I'll show that to you. So on here I'm trying to get it you know basically within a degree and I just have to really try to make sure that I'm looking directly at it so I don't get a little error if my eyes a little off to the left or right it makes it hard to hit it right on. Now just for the sake of showing you when I was referring to the uh, mark that the manufacturer put on here for the declination I think you can see that it says 70 there there the line goes right up to it and it's easier to see it and get it right on it but uh, I'll show you from a little farther distance okay now so you can imagine if I'm doing this when I'm actually using my stuff if I try to get down really close and look at this if the telescope's sitting right here I gotta try to put my head in between here and it's just hard to do so it's just an awkward position to use in practice. So I put a piece of tape with a piece of paper and a mark just on the opposite side over here on the outside just because it's easier for me to view it there. And as long as I'm showing you here's the manufacturer's mark on the right ascension which again I had kind of the same issue so when I made one that had the extra marks where I'd try to estimate within five minutes so I could split it up I had it slightly off to the side is a little easier for me to get a view there I could matter of fact at one point I've had one taped on over here for the north and south but I just kept bumping it and knocking it off and I found that when I had it on the outside it just stayed put better. Okay, so now that I've kind of given you an idea of what each circle is about and how they work, what you do, first thing to do, you know, get your telescope pretty well polar aligned. And again, if you've watched my polar alignment video, I talk about how you don't have to be perfect on your polar alignment, but closer is better. It's just a matter of how much time you want to put into it, because it can get really frustrating trying to get it perfect, but if you can get it reasonably close, it'll help. And it'll make a difference with your setting circles too, because if your polar alignment's fairly close, when you try to hop from one place to another, like say if you start off on a star that is zero hours right ascension and let's just say zero degrees uh, in your declination and then you want to so when you do is when you find that star you get it centered in your eyepiece and if you want to really get it centered good what you do is gradually work from a low power eyepiece to a high power eyepiece and if possible get one that has a set of crosshairs in it an illuminated crosshair they're not a necessity but if you want to you know spend the money on that kind of an eyepiece it'll help you get things more accurately centered but you don't have to have one and uh, so if you get it as centered as you can and then you set your setting circles and try to get them as close as you can to mark the address for what that particular star or object is and usually what you do when you do that you find a bright star that you're certain about what it is like maybe you'll look up and you'll see Vega for example which is 
you know, just extraordinarily bright, it's easy to figure out which star it is. And then if you want to go from there, say if you were going from Vega to say M57, you would just look up the address for M57, make your move in uh, east and west here on your RA, which will make this turn, and you'd move it over. So you move it, these times aren't accurate for where M57 is, but let's say you move it from zero hours to one hour, and let's say you move it from zero degrees to three degrees, which I say those aren't the correct ones, but it gives you an idea you're going from point A to point B, and hopefully the thing's gonna be right there. Now, if you're using low power eyepieces when you do this, you've got a better chance of it landing in the field of view, and then you gradually go into a higher power and center it up. And in some instances, you might find that it's not quite there. A lot of times what I've found, if I had things set up pretty good, the object really was there, but sometimes if it's something that's really faint, it's just hard to see it. Sometimes you just aren't gonna be able to see some of these faint things because of a little bit of a hazy layer of clouds or if you have light pollution or maybe your telescope doesn't grab enough light to see some of the really faint things. And then if you start looking, you can buy all kinds of special filters to help you see them more, which I'll give you a hint. A lot of these filters, now if you get a broadband light pollution filter, I think those help a lot visually. But if you get something like say an O3 filter, Oxygen 3, everything looks really dark in it. But what it does is it blocks out all the other light except what they would call the Oxygen 3 layer, which I guess you could say Oxygen 3 is a color, but it won't look like a color to us, it'll just look gray. And it makes, it increases the contrast is what it does. But just be aware that things look really dark in it, but if you get things set up it'll help you see faint nebula and stuff like that better okay so hopefully I've made this a little clearer than mud anyway but the thing to remember with using setting circles the larger the field of view you have when you're hopping from one object to another the better because it's just a it's not going to be easy to have something land dead center especially if you're using high power I mean if you're looking at something say you've got a something and you're looking at it at 100 power or something at a double star or something or a planet whatever and you decide you want to jump over to another planet or another double star it's going to be next to impossible to actually have it land in the center of that same high power spot when you're doing these these are more for working your way with low power and it does work and uh, i'm going to show you a little bit on a chart too about star hopping because that comes into play since you're doing something here that's kind of low tech and it's a good thing to learn how to do it's it's good to learn the sky maps even if you have an actual go-to telescope because you still need to be able to identify some of the stars if you buy a computerized go-to scope and you get it out there and you point it and you say okay i want to see saturn I'm going to look at the rings of Saturn. That's fine, but you still have to tell the telescope where it's at to begin with. So you need to figure out where north is and get yourself more or less polar aligned, and you need to be able to identify a few bright stars so that you can say where it's at. Because what you would do in that case is tell you to, when you do your star alignment, maybe you'd go find Vega, for example. You'd look at your map, and it's pretty easy to find, figure out where it's at especially if you have an area that's fairly dark, because then you'd be able to see the rest of the constellation and you'd see the little parallelogram-shaped box of the constellation Lyra. And then let's say after you center that up and you tell it you're on Vega, it says, okay, let's go look at Deneb, because Deneb's fairly close by. And if you look at your map, you can see that Deneb is part of a constellation called Cygnus, which is supposed to be a swan, but when I look at it, I think it looks kind of like a sword or a cross. And uh, it's easy to figure out which part of that is Deneb because it's a bright blue star just like Vega, but it's not as bright, so they're easy to tell the difference. So then you would center that, and basically the telescope would go back and forth between those two stars, and you would fine-tune the position, and then it would program in so it knows where your error is, and it could find it. And then you could throw in third star, fourth star, whatever, and kind of improve what you're doing with finding it. But even when you're using the computer, when you need to learn some of the sky, and that's really part of the fun of uh, you know getting out a telescope and looking at stuff.